You're listening to a Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production. Well, first of all, before we begin, I have the pleasure to introduce to you Brother John S. Nagy, who is a Masonic presenter, educator, and very well known in Masonic circus due to his knowledge on various Masonic topics. He is a member of the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of Florida. God save Florida. <laughs> okay. And I have invited him because he was here about two weeks ago over at Verity Lodge in Kent. And he gave a, a speech at the dinner and a workshop on a Masonic topic. And I think that Masonic top is, we're gonna see the introduction today. So if we can all give him a round of applause. To um, thank you very much. John, the floor is yours, my all brother. Right. Thank you, Brother Aponte. It's an honor and privilege to be here with good brothers and friends and fellows. Welcome to a Building Better Builders Uncommon Masonic Education and a Brother Asks. These are workshop materials that I've been conveying in one form and another for, oh gosh, about maybe 14 or 15 years now. And this particular section represents maybe about 20 or 30 minutes of a typical six-hour workshop that I do in and around the country, either by in-person and or via Zoom like you see here today. And the intent of these workshops and these presentations are to share light with the frontline workers. We call them mentors, trainers, coaches, and instructors, but quite honestly, they're the vanguard. They are teaching our next generations in tremendous ways and supporting them toward betterment. These presentations are based on some of the books that I've written over the years. This particular presentation is about hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is a long $25 word for the art and science of interpretation. And part and parcel of the reason why I have created this presentation is because so many brothers come at me saying, well, everybody's got their own interpretation as infinite interpretations. And I say to them, well, yes, this is true. You are absolutely right. Everybody's got their own interpretation and there are infinite interpretations. However, if you learn the art and science of interpretation, you recognize that there is a finite set of interpretations that are only actually valid for what it is that you are interpreting as it applies to the context of the matter in question. With that being said, I'm going to continue the presentation by saying we all communicate in one form or another. And in that communication, we've got a message that wants to be sent. And there's an intention behind sending that particular message. And as a result of trying to send a message, that individual who is going to convey that message is going to interpret it in such a way that they believe it's going to be encoded just right so that as it is being transmitted to whoever happens to be in the direct line of sight either in that moment or sometime in the future, could be 300, could be 3,000 years in the future, that person, if they have enough information, can decode that message, interpret it, and discover the intent and the actual message that was being conveyed. Now, it seems like it's pretty straightforward. However, Hermes is a very mercurial god, and that mercurial God basically means that you've got quicksilver in your hands when you try to go and interpret it. And until you've been trained to interpret things, you're going to be all over the place. And I like to start off by saying, if you want to start understanding what interpretation is, you want to go straight to the dictionary and look at some of the dictionary meanings that are offered, including some of the earlier renderings of what the word was intended to mean when it was first coined and the various branches where that particular word is being used in a specific way. Uh, right now, based on what I've got on the screens, hermeneutics in the noun form is a science of interpretation. 
especially when it comes to the revealed Word of God. And there are a whole bunch of branches of theology that actually deal with interpretation and principles and methodology of interpretation. And they got a special word for it. It's called exegesis. And in philosophy is actually the study and interpretation of human behavior in social institutions. And if you get into the existential aspects, it's the discussion of the purpose of life. But for purposes of what we are doing Let's just keep it really simple and say it's the science and art of interpretation. When you go to interpret things that you need to consider, and I caution very strongly that you really need to consider these things when you go to interpret. And also, when you hear somebody else's interpretation, you want to know how they went about interpreting and get their best thoughts on how they came to what they were interpreting. When you interpret things literally, you need to look at the most common definitions. But in addition to the dictionary definitions, you want to look at the historical meaning that is assigned to whatever you're interpreting. You want to look at the actual roots, the etymology of what it is that you are interpreting. And last but not least, I can tell you that if you don't look at the archaic and obsolete aspects of the words that you are looking at, you are missing tremendous information. I'll give you an example. This is a hermeneutical example, and it has to do with King Solomon's temple. Now, we all know that King Solomon's temple is rooted in allegory taken from a historical and literal source, but the King Solomon's temple in masonry is allegory, which basically means everything represents something else. So when we hear King Solomon, we already know King Solomon represents wisdom. And when you hear the word temple, we might go for the very first definition, and, and basically it's a house of worship. However, if we scroll down to the 17th definition in the dictionary, you'll find what is called an obsolete definition, and literally the meaning or definition of temple in the 17th definition listed it's obsolete, and it means body. So if we went with a temple of worship, it could be wisdom's temple of worship or house of worship. But if we go down to the 17th definition and assign King Solomon's temple to an interpretation, an allegorical interpretation, literally King Solomon's temple translates to a body of wisdom. And if we incorporate that into what it was that the ruffians were attempting to avoid, they hadn't completed the temple. Well, what had they not completed? Well, what they did not complete was obtaining a body of wisdom, which is the allegorical interpretation of King Solomon's temple. And it makes so much sense because to understand what the master's word is conveying, you have to have a body of wisdom backing your ability to interpret what it is that the master's word is trying to convey. So I strongly suggest when it comes to Masonic interpretation, scroll down to those obsolete and archaic definitions because the people who wrote ritual certainly knew how to hide things in plain sight. Now, other things to consider are the moral aspects. This means the ethics, morality, cultural lessons, and the existential aspect of the interpretation. And if you do not understand the culture and the morality of the times and the ethics of the time, you're going to miss an entire aspect of what it is that is trying to be conveyed. Now, I will give you an example of that. There were about 2,000 years ago, people who are very, very upset that the fact that they had to carry equipment that the soldiers put in front of them they had to carry that equipment one mile. So they complained to a very, very wise individual back then and said, the law requires us to carry this equipment one mile, and we have to take time out of our day. And the law doesn't require anybody, any of these soldiers, to pay us for carrying their equipment one mile. So this sage turns around and says, we'll go the extra mile. And they all thought this was unbelievable wisdom.
because what it meant is if they grabbed a hold of these soldiers' equipment, these very soldiers that were occupying the Mediterranean around that time, what happened is if they grabbed a hold of this equipment and they carried it one mile and kept on going for another mile or maybe two or three, those soldiers were required to pay them for every extra mile that they carried that equipment. Now, these were people who were being uh, oppressed by an occupying force, and they complained about the law being unjust. And what this learned attorney, this rabbi, turned around and said, well, use the law basically against your oppressors and carry that load an extra mile, go the extra mile. And therefore, the time that you put in carrying that equipment would be paid for. How soon do you think the occupying force was going to cease asking those people to carry their equipment one mile when they realized they would have to outrun them to tackle them after that one mile to prevent themselves from having to pay that extra mile? If you don't know the ethics, morality, culture, and the lessons and the traditions of that time, even the laws of what you're interpreting, you're going to come to an entirely different conclusion that could very well be erroneous to what it is that is trying to be taught in the lessons that are being conveyed. Figuratively, and you're taking an interpretation not only do you want to look at the historical, ethical, moral, and also the literal, you want to take a look at the figurative. Figurative expressions have to do with metaphor, as in, instead of saying a person is like a lion, a metaphor basically says that person is a lion, meaning that the person has the qualities of the lion. And in interpretation, you have to understand that if it's a metaphorical conveyance, you have to take it metaphorically, and you have to look at the qualities rather than the literal interpretation. Analogical interpretation is another way of interpreting along with allegorical, which with the allegory, allegory is one character, or shall I say, a personification of something occurs. King Solomon was the personification of wisdom. King Hiram of Tyre was a personification of strength, a.k.a. resources, and he did exactly that. He provided the resources for the temple. And last but not least, we had Hiram of Biff, who allegorically represented beauty. So if you take a look at the way a figurative conveyance occurs and you interpret it, I'll give you an example of that. The ruffians literally represented undisciplined behavior. And Hiram Abiff represented beauty. Rubbish is the unbelievable trash and garbage that is stirred up by undisciplined spirits. Japa, the word literally means beautiful. And 40 is the amount of miles that had to be traveled from Temple Mount to Japa. So when we put all those allegorical things together, the entire tale takes on a spin that is extremely revealing. And it goes like this. These undisciplined spirits literally try to use strength to beat the secrets of the Master Mason out of beauty. And beauty would not yield. And finally, beauty was buried in the very rubbish that was created by these undisciplined spirits. And they killed beauty and buried beauty in their own rubbish. And they departed, went 40 miles, and they were tested. And when they finally were done tested, they wound up at the gates of beautiful, which is Joppa. And Joppa rejected them. And they were rejected. The undisciplined spirits were literally rejected. And even if they tried to convince beauty that money could buy them passage, they were turned down because they did not have wisdom's passport. The entire tale takes on a different meaning when you understand that the allegorical conveyance is the personification of different attributes, which I just shared in a respinning of the Hiram Abiff tale from the point of death to the point of rejection. 
idiomatical is another aspect of figurative interpretation that you have to understand. Idiomatic is where you have idioms conveying information. And I'll give you three or four examples of idiomatic conveyance. It's raining cats and dogs. Well, we know it's not raining cats and dogs. Somebody is sleeping with somebody. Well, we know they're not sleeping. And we also have kicking the bucket. And when we hear the term kick the bucket and we can't figure out why the person is no longer in the story until we understand that kicking the bucket means the person died. Well, they didn't kick a bucket. They died. We now understand why they're no longer conveyed in any other way than the past tense in a story. And last but not least, the master's word. The master's word is an idiom. It is conveying something utterly different than what it is that the literal words are being conveyed with. And I'll leave that one to let you scratch your head with. I had somebody back on October 1st, 2011, back in Boynton Beach, the research lodge had me come down there and do my first official Building Better Builders workshop. And at the very end, a person raises their hand and says, Brother Nagy, is this information that you're conveying approved by any Grand Lodge of any jurisdiction in the world, or is it just your interpretation? And I smiled and I said, well, there's some problems, challenges, and opportunities faced with using that particular word. And then what I did as I proceeded to explain everything that I could at that moment about interpretation, that's translation, it's giving meaning and explaining and construing and even showing a series of conveying uh, actions. And I went through the entire list. I said, finally, but the reality of it is, yeah, it's just my interpretation. And the problem with that is anything that you hear from me is going to be your interpretation as well, because you can't help but interpret it in the way that you're going to hear it. And if you don't understand that we are encoding and decoding in our own special way, and that we have to be on the same page to come to the same conclusions, you're going to be severely limited in your travels. So I turned around and I flashed this up on the screen and I said, however, it's not just an interpretation. It's not an either or. See, what I'm doing is I'm sharing what is called a perspective. And if you don't understand what perspective is, interpretation is going to befuddle you because depending on how you're looking at something will determine how you're going to see the results. And so I'm sharing multiple perspectives in the idea that what it is that I'm describing will ultimately be understood by you when you interpret it and you put it all together and hopefully you'll see what it is I'm really trying to say. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example of multi-level interpretation that hopefully will be delightful. It'll be thought-provoking and fun for you to go through with me. And this is what you can actually do if you've got a firm foundation from the entered apprentice work that you've done, along with the training that you received as a fellow craft going through the seven liberal arts and sciences. So let the fun begin. If you've ever heard the term, beware the Ides of March, this is a beautiful example of interpretation. And if you take it literally, well, you'd know that it was the 15th of March. Everybody would know that because everybody nowadays thinks of the 15th of March as the Ides of March. I mean, you can literally see on some calendars Ides of March in the 15th day slot. And you might even try to back it up by saying, well, in the Roman calendar, the eighth day of after the noons of corresponding to the 15th of March, May, July, and October, or the 13th of other months. And the reason why it's the 13th is because the Romans used to have 13 months. And what they did was they started borrowing days off the 13th month because they never recognized it as a month, and they built up all the other months. And if you recognize that months are actually 29.5 days, and if you take 28 days and divide it into 365, you wind up with roughly 13 months. It's like, okay, John, that's a lot of information. 
However, we get this term, beware the Ides of March from Shakespeare. So we now find out that it's not something just on the calendar. It actually had something rooted and it comes from Shakespeare. And that play that Shakespeare wrote was called The Life and Death of Julius Caesar. And this term, this phrase came up in Act 1, Scene 2, when the soothsayer said to Caesar, beware the Ides of March. So if we were to put all that we have just discussed into action, we might conclude that the soothsayer said to Caesar, beware the Ides of March, as in beware the time of the 15th of this particular month of March. And we might be very, very satisfied and pat ourselves on the back because, well, we heard the phrase and we know where the calendar date falls. So we just put two and two together and we come to this conclusion. However, if we look at the roots of the word that are involved in this term and look at the etymology, we recognize that, well, a month literally is a cognate of moon. And we know that the beginning of the month starts with the first crescent, and nine days later is noons, and the end of the month, and this is a moon cycle. And we call them months now, but they're really moons, as in moon cycles. And the original Roman calendar actually was lunar, not solar. And we know that the Roman calendar was this way, and the months began right at the new moon. And this is what the new moon actually looked like. If you ever looked up in the sky, that's exactly what you would see, nothing. However, the day of Calends, which is the first of Crescent, and then you have the days of noon and the days of Ides, and each, every one of them, we get the calendar from the days of Calend, which is actually the first Crescent. And nine days later, or noons, is nine days after that first Crescent. And of course, the full moon was the day of Ides. Now, if we go ahead and take all this next information about the etymology and apply it to the situation, you might conclude that the soothsayer said to Caesar, beware of the time of the full moon during March. And all of a sudden, the beware of the Ides of March is no longer the 15th. It's now, it's the full moon. Beware of it. Of course, we could actually take another interpretive spin and take a look at the culture. And we could understand that Callens was, again, the first crescent of the moon. This is when the priests would proclaim the timing of the month when debts were coming due, as in the crescent was when it would say, hey, we got a new moon cycle. Nine days later, they would announce, okay, we got a full moon or the debts are due on the full moon. And in ancient Rome, the debts and interest were often payable on the Ides if that was the agreement. So everybody wanted to know when the full moon is or when the Ides were occurring so that they would be able to know when either they had to pay up or they had to get paid. And I can tell you that Shakespeare knew this because in Act 3, Scene 1, right after Caesar got assassinated, Brutus proclaims to the people the following phrase, people and senators, be not affrightened, fly not, stand stiff, ambition's debt is paid. Now, I can't help but think that Shakespeare knew about this debts being due at that particular time because he cleverly wove it into the assassination of Julius Caesar right at time of the full moon or when debts come due. I don't think it's a coincidence, my friends. And again, this is just my interpretation. You're going to have to look into it yourself. However, we might actually conclude based on the third interpretation that the soothsayer was saying to Caesar, not beware the Ides of March, but literally communicating in a very direct manner for somebody who would know about this, beware when the debts come due in March. Of course, we know that Caesar did not pay any attention to the soothsayer. But if we take a look at the actual historical aspect of all the terms being used, Ides actually is a Latin form for the Ides. 
And the word actually originated from the Etruscan, and the original meaning was either the divide or divide. And the interesting thing is, if we throw that into the mix and understand that Ides is the, literally the divide in March, he, the soothsayer was saying to Caesar, beware of the upcoming division, which is exactly what it was that Caesar faced. He was facing the division within the Senate, and he became a pincushion as a consequence of not heeding the soothsayer's statement to Caesar. There's a lot of different ways and methodologies of interpreting. I just gave you one example of going down the rabbit hole using literal interpretation, historical etymology, cultural. And if you take a look and look hard down the rabbit hole, you're going to see a whole bunch of different ways of going about interpreting things. The important thing is you want to make sure that you do it thoroughly as you're investigating, particularly when it comes to Masonic things, because when it comes to Masonic things, there's a lot of Masonic rabbits being chased by individuals. And if they don't understand the basics of the art and science of hermeneutics, their interpretations are going to be filled with conjecture rather than pure speculation. You've been listening to A Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production.